Hi, my name's Jake. Um, for the last year or so, I've been working here at the Morsley Hospital. I've been working as an independent mental health advocate. Now, what that is, is uh, if a person's detained under the Mental Health Act, they have a right to see an independent advocate. So we're not part of the mental health system as such, but we work for an independent charity. What we do is we support people to understand their rights and to exercise their rights. So that might include explaining someone's section to them or accompany them to a ward round to support them to ask questions to the doctors. Um, because we're not part of the mental health system, we have a slightly different viewpoint to a lot of the professionals. And I think we see it quite a lot from the patient's viewpoint. So we hear a lot about the things the patients are unhappy with, or if they're afraid of saying these things to the professionals, they will talk to us. So we maybe get a slightly different um, insight into the mental health system. As a patient in a psychiatric ward, you're in a very, very difficult situation. You, you know, you've, you've lost your freedom, you're taken away from your friends and family, you're forced to take medication you don't want to take, and the more angry you get, the more chance of that being seen as part of your illness. So I see people come into the hospital um, they get worse from, from what I've seen. I've seen people get worse because they get so upset about being being imprisoned in hospital and they start acting up and then that's seen as their illness. Um, also you the, use the word imprisoned in hospital. Yeah. Do you see like this hospital as similar to people being well, in prison? A, a lot of my clients have told me that it's worse than prison because I've worked with people who've been in the prison system as well. They said at least in prison they don't force you to take medication and you know when you're going to get released. I've heard that two or three times, people saying they actually prefer prison to the, to the hospital. So regarding medication, every single person I've worked with in the last year has been put on antipsychotics um, almost immediately um, upon entering the hospital with or without their consent. Either they agreed to it or they're sort of coerced into it or they're just frankly forced to take it. Um, so regardless of the diagnosis, it's always antipsychotics, and it's, it's normally the same drugs. It's, it's almost everyone is um, given one of the same four medications. If one doesn't work, they try another one. Which and they, drugs are they? So um, normally the first drug they'll try is risperidone, or then they'll try elantapine. Um, these drugs don't work, they try the older antipsychotics like uh, haloperidol. And for the people who don't respond to anything, they will try clozapine, which is a another antipsychotic that has lots of side effects and the person has to be really closely monitored. But yeah, everyone is given these drugs regardless of diagnosis. Most of the people on, on the wards are, I've worked with, people diagnosed with some kind of psychotic illness. So not so much depression, sort of believing unusual things, paranoid ideas, uh, sort of those, those kind of problems. Um, now the, a lot of people don't want to take antipsychotics. I, I don't think I've met a single patient who had anything positive to say about antipsychotics. I've seen people um, develop, develop diabetes very young, you see people very bloated, everyone complains about sort of stiffness, um, a lot of people complain about a kind of apathy, difficulty concentrating, um, depression, these kind of symptoms. Uh, you see people with these kind of Parkinson's disease symptoms, uh, they're, they're sort of shaking and their the tongue is flicking in and out and that's from long-term treatment of antipsychotics and it's, it's irreversible uh, that treatment. So people have quite good reasons to object to these drugs. I mean, would you want to take them knowing you know, the side effects? Uh, but once a person objects to the drugs, then they will be forced into taking the drugs. And there's not really much negotiation, there's not really alternatives offered. Even though within the Mental Health Act, well, there's a separate document called the, the Code of Practice um, that has things in it like the participation principle that patients should participate as much as possible in their treatment. There's the least restriction principle that any intervention should be the least restrictive as possible. Um, from what I've seen, these, these principles are not really followed. As soon as the patient disagrees with the medication, they are coerced or forced into taking it. As soon as you disagree with the professionals, you're in trouble, basically. And you will get people who have three different diagnoses, depending on which psychiatrist they, they've met, they get a different diagnosis. But if they question the diagnosis, that's seen as part of their illness, and it's used to justify forced treatment. It's in the staff room in the hospital, and they're talking about a, a patient who has refused his medication. I'd, I'd met the patient and had a conversation with him maybe five minutes before. He looked quite upset that he wasn't 
showing any signs of extreme distress or anything like that. He just wasn't having the medication. So um, all the staff were getting ready to restrain him in the staff room. So they were talking about what they were going to do. They were putting their gloves on. They were sort of organising. And they, they seemed to be talking about it in a very nonchalant way, that as if, you know, this is just, this is what we have to do. He's not taking his medication. So um, they took him into one of the... Um, one of the activity rooms on the ward and they, they got a mattress on the floor and um, I didn't actually see the restraint but uh, I went in the room afterwards and he was sat on the mattress crying because he was so sort of traumatised by what had happened and this wasn't someone who was violent this wasn't someone who was um, trying to get out or trying to hurt anybody or anything like that it was just somebody who didn't agree with the medication that had been prescribed by the doctor. People I work with, they do have insight into the problems they're experiencing, but they just don't see it as due to an illness. So a person might say to me that they've had a breakdown because of a very stressful experience, or from a childhood trauma, or they were withdrawing from psychiatric medication and this caused them to sort of go a bit haywire. So people do have an insight, but they don't agree that they are mentally ill. And um, they're not alone in this. There's a lot of debates about mental illness. I mean, the British Psychological Society recently called for a move away from diagnosis, saying that these, these diagnoses, they're not backed up by any um, strong science. People might argue that this type of um, forced treatment is necessary because the people are so unwell, this is the only thing we can do to help them. So we're doing something they don't want to do, they, but you know, it's, it's the only thing, we don't like to do it, but we have to do it. That's the kind of argument used. Now, I'm, I'm not a medical professional, I'm not a doctor, but all I can say is I've met clients and patients, whatever you want to call them, who've been told, I've been told, you know, this person's very dangerous, or this person's very unwell, or probably too unwell to speak to you, you know, be careful. And, and when I've sat down with the person and given them the opportunity to calm down and speak about sort of their frustrations and things like that on the ward, they've actually you know, calm down, had a very normal conversation with me. But because the staff are always kind of checking up on the person or getting them to do things they don't want to do, the, the staff don't see that side of the person. They just see this kind of angry, um, angry individual. And then that, that's just pathologized and seen as part of their illness. So I fully appreciate people do get themselves into terrifying and dangerous situations, and it, it's real. I'm not saying that, you know, these, um, problems don't exist but to take someone who's gone into this sort of extreme state of mind to lock them up to force them to take powerful tranquilizers not to not listen to them um, I don't see that as the best way to help the person and it can't be the only way because you don't see much else if you go into a lot of the wards you see the staff are in the staff room doing their paperwork yeah, they patients don't talk are, to the patient. they don't talk I mean no, in some boards, but often they you see that the patients are pacing up and down. Yeah. So you're locked up, you've got no one to talk to, you've got nothing to do. So how do you think people are going to act? It's such a, it's such a bizarre place to be in. I don't see how a person can recover. And that probably explains why they have to medicate the people so much, because just to tolerate being in the hospital. But there's been quite a lot of stuff in the media about restraint in mental health. I think. Uh, Mind or Rethink or someone like that are doing a campaign against uh, face down restraint and you hear a lot about this. Um, I think there's a, a wrong perception about this. People think that restraint happens when the person's being aggressive and they need to be controlled. Um, in those cases, okay, fair enough, you know, that it might be necessary to stop a person from hurting themselves or someone else, but um, all of the restraints that I've witnessed or I've been told about by my clients have been because people were given a depot injection so that means they've been given an injectable medication that you take either monthly or fortnightly instead of the tablets. Now the people have objected to this either saying they don't want the medication or they would prefer tablets. Um, when the people object to it they are held down and restrained face down and injected with the, the medication. I've heard a lot of people tell me that's happened. Um, these are not people who are being violent or being aggressive all they're doing is refusing to have an injection and asking for tablets instead. Um, from the point of view of the professionals, they want the person medicated um, so they're subdued, they're not doing anything dangerous. They want the, med you know, the person on the medication, so they will do almost anything to get the person to have the injection. 
a lot of the time they don't restrain the person, but they threaten to restrain the person. So they will say, if you don't take your meds, if you don't take the injection, we're going to restrain you. Because it's such a terrifying experience being restrained, people will consent to the injection um, just, just for that reason. Just to say, this, these medications are always antipsychotics. These are the, the injectable medications. So it's not, it's not as if someone's in a kind of frenzied state and they're trying to sedate the person to calm down. These are, these are sort of long-term medications. So there'll be cases when a person is simply saying, I don't want the injection, I'd rather take my medication in tablet form. Uh, they, from what I've seen, they won't hesitate to then use physical force on that person. I mean, I've seen people crying and shaking in absolute distress following being held down and restrained and you know th this is a psychiatric hospital a lot of the patients here have a lot of fears they feel they're being persecuted they have a lot of you know sometimes strange ideas about you know being kidnapped or sort of hunted and things like this so can you imagine how it's going to be for a person like that to be forcefully taken by six people held down and injected but from what I've seen the professionals don't seem to appreciate the impact of what they're doing they just see it as you know, this is the medication that's best for the person. The person doesn't agree because they don't understand their illness. So then we're going to use force. So there's no attempts at um, negotiation because there's, there's a lot of stuff in the mental health um, code of practice or in the policies of the hospital about restraint as a as a um, last resort. So if the person's acting violently, you try to speak to them, try to calm them down you know, give them space, find out what's bothering them, all of it, this is, you know, this is done. But when the person is refusing the medication, that seems to go out the window and they will go straight in with the restraint. So you, you hear a lot about uh, stigma in mental health and there's a lot of anti-stigma campaigns and a lot of funding to sort of fight the stigma. What these campaigns want is for us to be comfortable to talk about mental illness. So I can say to somebody, I'm, I'm mentally ill, but I'm not ashamed, I'm happy to talk about it. I think you know there's good intention behind this campaign because we don't want people to be stigmatised. But what about the people who disagree that they're mentally ill? Because most of the clients I work with don't see themselves as mentally ill. So wouldn't that be the best type of anti-stigma to, to tell them they're not mentally ill? You might have got into this terrifying, bizarre situation, but we don't have to label you as sick. You know, let's let's find out what's happened to you and let's do something about it. But as soon as you label someone, then all of their behaviour is going to be interpreted on the basis of that label. So if someone's angry because they're locked up in hospital, that might be seen as part of their, their illness. And this kind of labelling just destroys the communication between the client and the professional. Because if the client doesn't agree, there's no sort of starting point, there's no, there's no scope for a negotiation. Because everything they have, have to say can potentially be silenced on the basis that they don't know what they're saying because they're unwell. This is a big debate that's happening outside of the hospitals. A lot of people are calling in, to, calling into question this whole idea of um, mental illness. Because if you um, look at psychiatric diagnosis, there's no blood test, there's no brain scan or anything like that. What they do, they interview the patient and they look for certain symptoms. So if a person's hearing voices, if they're feeling depressed, um, if they're speaking in a kind of sort of very fast or exaggerated way, these kind of things, they will look at the symptoms and then they kind of look at the statistical clusters of symptoms and that's how the diagnosis is arrived at. So there's no actual, um, no physical tests. So people are having debates about, well, should we even be using this approach? Should we be labeling people as mentally ill? With all the stigma that comes with it, shouldn't we be looking at this as emotional distress or looking at this as a social problem? Um, so these debates are happening. Anti-stigma campaign should be supporting people to say, you know what, I'm not mentally ill, I had a crisis, some bad things happened to me, but I'm not a sick person who needs to be drugged. And that's what I think anti-stigma campaign should be about. People experienced, um, you know, have told me, oh, I was just at home and they came and kicked my door down and handcuffed me and dragged me off to hospital. So people have these memories of these horrible experiences, so they don't want anything to do with mental health services. But then the more they try and get away from the services, the more this justifies the kind of forced treatments. So I work with a lot of people who are on um, community treatment orders. So that basically gives the hospital um, the power to recall the person. So they're living in the community, but they can be called back into hospital. In reality, because people are so terrified of going into hospital, the CTO is just used as a way of coercing people to take their medication. 
And I've had many, many clients who absolutely hate the medication, but because of the CTO, they're terrified of being taken back into hospital. Um, so they take the consent to treatment, but only, only from fear. So if you imagine the type of resentment that's going to create between the professionals and, and the clients, but the more the, prof the more the clients get angry and push away from the professionals, the more they're labelled as lacking insight and the more forced treatment is used. How can that in any way be therapeutic when a lot of the time people have to believe that what they are taking you is going to do them good. If they don't believe it's doing them good, yeah. then it's not going to be therapeutic anyway, would you I mean, say? <coughs> you get, I've seen people who have been very psychotic and um, very confused, and then when the medication has kicked in, they, uh, they do come, they sort of do come back down and you can speak to them. But even then, they would rather be psychotic than be on the medication, because the way it makes them feel is, um, is so unpleasant. I've seen from the way patients who are detained are treated, basically, it's not much, they're not given much hope for recovery. They're basically drugged up until the point where they're considered safe to be released. So there's not really, I mean, there, there are recovery services, and there's, there's a whole scope of services um, within this trust, but from what I've seen on the acute wards, it's very much get the person medicated, get them stable, get them out. Hopelessness uh, on the wards, and there's a real sense of these people can't really be helped, so the best we can do is medicate them, get them stable, and let them go. People aren't told, you know, you've had a crisis, but you can recover. They're just simply told, take these medications. So there is a real say, even amongst the staff, there's a, yeah, there's a hopelessness, the only way I can describe it. And I think once the person is kind of labelled as mentally ill, and they go into the system, that person, they, in a way, they're, they're kind of pensioned off, you know, they, they're often written off. Talk about recovery and the services, we should have a recovery model instead of illness model and all the rest of it. But in reality, what I've seen, on the acute wards, and these are the wards where the people need the most help, you could argue, the people who've had the most intense kind of crisis. Um, it's just very punitive and it's very um, knee-jerk and it's just get on the medication and, and that's it. And there's very little going on other than that kind of um, well, medicalization and um, forced treatment. There's not really much or even if you do consent, but there's, there's not really much else happening. There's a perception that um, psychotherapy is very expensive, and you will hear that any time you try and mention, you know, what alternatives are there, you will hear straight away, all oh, psychotherapy is very expensive. That might be the case, but compassion is free. It doesn't cost anything to treat someone like a human being, spend time with them, get to know with them, talk to them about normal things, not about their illness and the medication, just, just normal conversation. And, yeah, you see it on some boards, but I've spoken to student nurses who've told me they've been told off for being too friendly with the patients. Which, uh, frankly, is disgusting. A person in a, in a crisis, that's what they need. They need compassion and support. So you don't need them, a fancy psychotherapist with five years of training. You, you know, it might be better just to, to treat the person well and to talk to them and um, have a kind of normal human conversation, whereas the professionals Wards, they're not really doing that, they're just assessing the person, seeing how they are so they can write their reports, so they can justify what they're doing. There's not really a sense of getting, them, getting to know the person or empowering the person to recover. One client who, um, she was told she had a psychotic illness and needed antipsychotic medication. Uh, she disagreed with that and felt that what she was experiencing was more of a psychological issue and she wanted support from a psychologist. So she got a psychologist um, to come and visit on the ward um, and really enjoyed it and felt like she was getting somewhere. Now, I saw her being told by a psychiatrist on the ward that because she believed psychology could help her, this was evidence that she was ill and needed to be sectioned. And I'm not making that up, I witnessed that being told. So as soon as you question their very, very narrow, sort of fixed way of looking at things, they won't hesitate to, to force you. Yes, so there's a perception that ECT uh, isn't used anymore. A lot of people think this is some barbaric thing from the past that is now banned, but it is still used, it's used in this hospital. 
um, the professionals would say that it's a last resort that is very effective when everything else fails. Um, I haven't seen it used many times, but the people I've seen it used on were people that if you did spend the time talking to them, getting to know them, they would talk to you. And they certainly weren't sort of catatonically depressed or anything like that. So um, I was quite surprised to see ECT being used in that way. There's a, there's a few clients that have been given ECT. There's one case as an elderly gentleman who was being given ECT against his will. Yeah. Um, the argument they were using was that he didn't have the capacity to consent to ECT. Um, to be honest, the way they were using the argument was because he disagrees with the ECT, therefore he doesn't have the capacity because he doesn't understand it's good for him, so we give it to him anyway. And this is something I've seen a few times. Now, this was an elderly man who was sat alone in the ward. Every time I went on the ward, he was sat in the corner on his own. When I sat with him and spoke to him, we had a, we had a little laugh and we had a chat especially when he was sort of complaining and talking about you know, the, the ECT and that he didn't want it anymore. And he, he kind of opened up and we, we talked about all sorts of things, really, with a normal conversation. But this is a, a man who's considered so unwell that the only way to help him is to force him to have an electrically induced seizure in his brain. That's the only way they, they think they can help him. But if you just sat with that person and spoke with them and treated them with respect, um, you could, you could help them. What you had he help. been diagnosed with? Because supposedly ECT is more used um, to treat depression, not psychosis. Was he on antipsychotic medication? He wasn't yet diagnosed with psychosis. Well, not, why are they giving him ECT? I, I can't remember the details. I think it was, it was not responding to the treatment. Well, so what? Yeah. That's not a reason no. to give people ECT. No. They might not be responding to the treatment because the treatment I mean, doesn't work. With ECT, the argument always is used is that it saves lives. So you have a person who's so depressed that they're, they're mm. catatonic, they're not speaking. Um, you give them the ECT, they kind of come out of it. Um, okay, maybe that's the case. What I've seen is people who are clearly speaking um, being forced to have ECT. To be honest, I've been very surprised by the level of coercion and forced treatment because. Um, the Mental Health Act has a, a sort of guideline document called the Code of Practice that explains how professionals should use the Mental Health Act. And it contains things like the participation principle, so that patients should participate in any decisions made. It also has the least restriction principle, that any intervention should be um, the least restrictive as possible. So you restrict the person only as much as you need to. Um, in reality, I'm not seeing it work like that. The patients don't really get any say in the treatment. They meet the doctor for 10 minutes once a week, they'll tell them what drugs to take. If they don't take the drugs, they'll be forced into taking the drugs. Um, there's also a kind of reward punishment system, because if you're sectioned, you can still have some leave, so you'll be allowed to go out and come back in. And that's often used as, um, I've seen it a few times, staff have said, if you behave yourself, we'll let you go out for your break. And that, that's totally against what leave is for. It's supposed to be a way of getting someone sort of used to being out and about, stopping them getting institutionalised, getting them ready um, you know, to be discharged. But here it's used as a sort of bartering tool to say, you know, if you do what you're told and you take your medication, we'll let you have a bit of leave. And often if people come back late from their leave, they will automatically lose their leave and they, they see it as a punishment. Um, how else would you see it? All different diagnoses people are given, but everyone I see is given the same medication, which is antipsychotic medication. Um, in one form or another, there's not a huge difference between these different medications. So it looks to me like the medication isn't being used to cure any, any illness or fix anything with their brain. It's simply being used to sedate the person, to calm them down, um, prevent them doing anything risky. So it's not a long-term fix to the problem. And this is not the only way of helping people. There are other interventions, for example, the uh, Open Dialogue System in Western Lapland, they have a sort of intensive social support system. So if someone's in a crisis and psychosis or anything like that, they will get lots of meetings with the family, talk it through. Um, they see psychosis as due to trauma. They don't see it as, um, as some kind of biological illness. They're said to have the best results in the Western world, so do look it up and read about it if you're interested. Um, they will use medication sparingly, they won't use it as a cure, they will use it as a tonic. 
So they often use, um, they will use things like sleeping pills if the person hasn't slept for a long time. But the, the, the kind of long minor tranquilizers, yeah, minor not tranquilizers. major tranquilizers. From what I've seen here, every single person is given major tranquilizers, uh, also known as antipsychotics. Well, a lot of people mm. that think that they were helped yeah. um, by the medication. And yeah. by, so, what would you say? Well, I mean, how would you explain that some people do feel that the medication made well, them feel better? I don't have any argument with anybody who benefits from medication and wants to take it, and they want to believe that. Um, that approach, because it might be it might be true for them. What I object to is people who do not agree with that. They look at it a different way, but they're being forced to accept this very sort of narrow view as there's something faulty with your brain. You need medication. Now, as I was saying before, it's not clear what causes these um, illnesses or these symptoms. It's not it's not known. Um, but I've seen doctors tell patients that it's like diabetes. As long as you keep having the injection, you'll be fine. Doctors are telling people it's like diabetes. They're just doing it to get them on the medication. They're not, they're not being honest with the people. If they were honest, they would say, we don't know what's caused you to behave like this. We don't know exactly what this drug's doing. But some psychiatrists believe that, mm. say, depression is caused by an imbalance yeah. in serotonin levels mm. and that uh, psychosis is caused by an imbalance in mm. dopamine levels. Oh, Although yeah. now the new theory is it's not serotonin that causes depression, it's an imbalance of glutamate. Well, there's always new theories and to me that's what makes the whole thing suspicious because it's always a new diagnosis and a new theory and you don't have this sort of with diabetes, suddenly, oh no, it's not caused by this, it's something else. You only get this in psychiatry, that, you know, when the new guidebook comes out, they have a new set of diagnoses. There's something a bit suspicious about the sort of, you know, the scientific basis for all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think, what we, even within psychiatry, though, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, an area that is hotly debated. There's all sorts of different opinions, and are we over-medicalising things, are we over... Um, Overusing drugs, you know, there's all these debates happening, and that, you know, that, that's that's why it's such an interesting subject. But if you're a patient on a locked ward, you are not allowed to have this debate. As soon as you start debating, that's seen as you lacking insight, and they would force the treatment on you. And that is what I've witnessed over the last year.